In the book of Genesis, we are told that the smelting and utilization of metals is something that developed very early in human history. And as with, of course, many technological advances, uh, it was primarily utilized in the art of warfare. We're told that uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, that a descendant of Cain by the name of Tubal Cain was the first uh, artificer of brass, uh, smelter of metals. And uh, we're told, both uh, from the book of Genesis, of course, as well as uh, from Josephus, the Jewish historian, and other uh, sources, uh, that uh, he was uh, a warrior and that the manufacture of metal uh, implements of war was, of course, a great technological advance, something to give him advantage over his fellows. This utilization of metals, the smelting of metals, was something that, uh, we're told here in Genesis, developed hundreds of years prior to the flood. It was developed very early in human history, was utilized uh, in weapons and implements of war, but was also utilized uh, in other ways as well. Within a rather short time, uh, there were many uh, different uh, utilizations of metals, and of course some metals are uh, very soft and easily, more easily shaped and, and uh, molded, uh, others are harder. And one of the things that was, uh, came to be understood very early on was the fact that the mixing of a couple of metals together, the mixing of, uh, for instance, uh, copper and zinc uh, to produce brass was uh, something that gave both the, uh, the qualities, it, it gave uh, a hardness uh, that was, uh, uh, it gave both uh, the qualities of the hardness as well as the malleability. It could be shaped uh, and, and it could be worked, uh, and yet it was much harder than uh, simply uh, the copper by itself. And so, in that sense, was far more uh, useful for uh, implements and weapons and things of this sort. This process, though, the process of smelting, and particularly the process of making alloys, such as brass or bronze, which was uh, brass and tin, this process involved the use of a particular instrument, uh, a sort of a clay pot that was uh, a clay crucible as it was called. Now, the crucible was utilized beginning very early on. In fact, as early as any use of metal alloys developed, uh, there had to be the use of the crucible. Now, into the crucible were placed, or was placed, the, the crushed metal ore, uh, which is uh, you know, found naturally in, in sort of a rock-like uh, uh, formation, and it, it was uh, uh, crushed to a certain extent, and put over in uh, this clay pot. Uh, there were, uh, there, charcoal was there, was the source of the, uh, was the source of heat. And, uh, of course, clay was utilized because it wouldn't melt. That's why the clay crucible was, was utilized, because it wouldn't melt. But what, of course, happened was that the metal uh, in the ore, that as the heat was applied, the metal melted. And as the metal melted, it ran down, became liquefied, ran down out of the ore, out of the rock, was formed into a usable, uh, a usable, uh, it, it made in a usable form. It, it, it came together, uh, collected there in the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the uh, crucible, or depending on the way that the crucible was shaped, but it was utilized uh, to uh, collect, to protect, to, uh, really to make the metal where it was usable, where it was something that could then be taken and used uh, in, a, in a useful fashion. Particularly in the forming of alloys, this was something that was essential. In, in other cases, there, there are examples, in fact, uh, uh, even on up into recent times, certain uh, primitive areas and tribes uh, have uh, saw, uh, sought to uh, smelt metal by simply the use of of a charcoal fire without the use of a crucible, and uh, of course what you have there is that a great deal of the metal is lost, some of it kind of runs out and uh, can be collected, but you really can't make an alloy, you can't uh, take uh, and, and uh, 
use certain things together without this use of a, uh, of a crucible. In fact, without the use of a crucible, uh, it would have been almost impossible uh, to have drawn from raw ore to a useful metal implement. It was something that uh, uh, served a, a valuable uh, a, a, a valuable purpose. It served to give shape and, and cohesion to the metal. It served to give a shape and cohesion so that what was collected was able to serve a useful function. When the, as long as the metal was in its raw state, as long as it was in the, uh, the ore, there was no particular useful function, whether it be uh, iron or copper or whatever it may be. Uh, it could only be utilized when it was, uh, when it was uh, collected, when it was uh, given shape and, and cohesion to where it was there in a usable, workable fashion. You may wonder what that has to do uh, with all of us. And yet, I think that there is a distinct analogy between the purpose and the function of the crucible in giving cohesion and, and, and distinction and shape to metal. There's a distinct analogy between the crucible and the family. Because the family, in some ways, is a vessel that God designed for the purpose of giving shape and cohesion to an entire generation. God did not design human beings as he did animals. He designed human beings, we're told, in the book of Genesis, after his own image, after his own likeness. Now, I want to go into some of that today, and I would like to focus in on some of both the purpose and functioning of the family, and to understand a tie-in with what I've previously mentioned. We're told in the book of Genesis that God made man in his image after his likeness. God did not make human beings after the animal kind. Now, so often, the scientists and those who study such things look around at the animals as a model. And they try to understand various things by looking at the animal world. That's not where you look to understand the proper functioning of the human family. God built into the animals the use of instinct. And instinct is primary uh, in animals. Certainly they can be taught uh, certain things. Uh, they can be trained. But animals operate by instinct. Within normally a very short time of the birth, uh, the young animals are able to function on their own. Because really, the only thing uh, that the, the young animals need uh, their parents for, in some cases, uh, such as with uh, cats or dogs or cows or things of that sort, really the only parent that they have any interaction with is the mother. Now, in the case of certain other animals, such as birds, uh, perhaps both the male and the female contribute to feeding the young. But... In either case, it is primarily a matter that physical needs are taken care of for a relatively short period of time, a matter of weeks or months, and the young is, within a relatively short period of time, able to begin to eat on its own. And once that has taken place, the young is able to function and to do what animals of that particular type do. Uh, whether with a dog or with a cat or with a cow or with a horse or, or uh, whatever it may be, God didn't design human beings that way. The role of the human family is far more important because God did not design animals with a family structure in the way that we have. The family is something that extends forward and backward 
We're told in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 127 and 128. Notice in, in Psalm 128. This is one of the Psalms that was traditionally read during the time between the uh, Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement uh, as the people prepared to go up to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle. One of the Songs that uh, are psalms of degrees that were uh, utilized. And we're told in Psalm 128, psalms that focus in on that setting, uh, the time of the world tomorrow, the time of the, uh, let's say, the significance of the period concerning the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles, that time period. It says in Psalm 128, Blessed is everyone that fears the eternal, that walks in his ways, for you shall eat the labor of your hands. Happy shall you be, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of your house. Your children like olive plants round about your table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the eternal. The Lord shall bless you out of Zion, and you shall see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yea, you shall see your children's children and peace upon Israel. Now, the fulfillment of that has not yet come in the full sense, but we don't see peace upon Israel. We don't see the good of Jerusalem all the days of our life. Right now, we see uh, the, the rockets uh, going over. We see the armies round about. We see the, uh, the trouble and the difficulty that besets that area of the world. But God says the time is going to come, and certainly that looks forward to the time of the world tomorrow. But he talks about the blessings of God, and one of the things that is described is, you shall see your children's children. Now, you know, in the animal world, while with some animals there is a certain interaction of the parent and the offspring, and for some that continues a little longer than with others, there is not a multi-generational connection. There is not a connection that spans generations backward and forward. God designed human beings that way. He talks about, uh, in the book of Proverbs, for instance, in Proverbs chapter 17, in verse 6, He says, children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. In other words, little kids take pride in their father, old men take pride in their grandchildren. That's just a, a kind of a rough paraphrase. Children's children are the crown of old men, the glory of children are their fathers. Now, what we have described here is a multi-generational connection. It tells us something about the family. The family was not intended or designed by God to be uh, a, a disposable entity. We live in, a, in an age where we want disposable everything. And, of course, now we're, we're confronting the problems from that, and so there is a certain emphasis on recycling. But we're, we're, we're such a convenience-oriented society, people don't want to be bothered. We, we had recycling years ago. You know, a lot of you uh, remember, as I did, uh, maybe collecting the, the, uh, the Coke bottles out of the, uh, out of the ditches uh, and, uh, you know, selling them, getting two cents a piece, which uh, was, a, was a pretty good deal. Uh, I remember uh, somehow, uh, you know, there was something about it. We, my dad had a little country store, and right across the road there was a, uh, uh, another lady who had a country store, and she had the post office in her store. And somehow, if my brother and I could go over to her store and get something, uh, that, was, that was something special, because we just kind of took for granted what we had. And, uh, of course, maybe she had some brand we didn't have. And uh, there, there was an old bench that uh, used to be out there and, uh, by her store under the sycamore tree, and people would sit out there and drink a Coke. 
and they toss it up under the, uh, toss it down or toss it where it kind of go up under the building. Because, of course, like old buildings in the country used to be, it was up uh, on uh, on pilings. And so uh, over a period of time, not only would there be bottles in the ditches, but there would be bottles uh, under her store that were rather easily gotten to. Uh, and uh, that was a good source of income. Go crawling up under there, you know, dig out the bottles and go in there and sell them to her. Uh, and uh, But, uh, you know, it was recycling. Uh, we, we didn't call it recycling. But uh, the idea was things got used over and over and over again. But then convenience came in. What's inconvenient? You know, use all these old glass bottles. Why? We'll, we'll have cans. And we will have uh, plastic bottles. Uh, and uh, then the store doesn't have to fool with collecting them and people don't have to, uh, to bring them back and you don't have to pay the two cent deposit if you take them away. And, and so what, what of course transpired was the, uh, was the change uh, in our society uh, from uh, the use of materials that were naturally recycled, such as uh, glass bottles, uh, to the use of, uh, of plastics and things of that sort. Now, of course, we're confronting the problems uh, that, that come when you just dump everything, just throw things away, and, and many of these things do not break down. They don't biodegrade, or if they do, it take, uh, you know, 5,000 years for them to do so. So uh, it doesn't really do most of us a whole lot of good. And, and we're, we're confronting that, but it is something that reflects the, the whole way of thinking of our society, which is a very convenient ori- convenience-oriented, throwaway society. We don't want to be bothered. God did not design the family to function that way. That was not the purpose of the family. It was to be simply disposed of, thrown away. No return, no deposit, disposable sort of society. And yet that is the way that it is often viewed uh, today, that, that is sort of the state of things. God designed the family here, as he talks about, uh, as, as a multi-generational unit, a unit that involves uh, a relationship that spans the generations, not something simply uh, to involve uh, parents taking care of and feeding young when they're so when they're uh, so immature that they can't get out and somehow come up with food for themselves the purpose of the family in the human environment in the human sphere is far greater than that far transcends the purpose of uh, family if you can call it that because it's not really a family in the animal realm the the family is what gives shape to the next generation. It, it is the, it is the, uh, uh, the means by which the next generation is, is uh, shaped and protected from, from all of the, uh, the, the trials and the heat and the, and the difficulties, the, the pressures of the world around. We live in a society, in a world, where the family in our Western world has, to a great extent, broken down. And so, as our young people are exposed to all of the problems, all of the pressures, all of the trials and difficulties, the Bible uses the analogy of fire and fiery trials to compare to uh, trials and pressures and difficulties. As our young people are exposed to those sorts of things, what is there to give them a sense of security, to give them, uh, to instill within them uh, discipline and knowledge, to instill within them the means of being able to cope and to handle life and to be prepared for the future. You see, God says in the book of Malachi, as he addresses the subject of marriage and the permanence of marriage, He talks about, in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, that the God of Israel hates putting away. He hates the dissolution and breakup of families. The dissolving of marriages that is rampant in our Western world. And verse 15 addresses the fact that God made one. He took two and made one. 
And the reason we're told in the midst of verse 15, why one? That he might seek a godly seed. That he might seek a godly seed. The reason that God took two people and made of them one, these twain shall become one flesh, God said to Adam and Eve, these two shall be one, a new unit, we're told that God established marriage as a permanent institution for the purpose of seeking a godly seed, of providing for the next generation, of giving the next generation their best chance, their best shot at life. We look at the contrast between marriage as God designed it. And again, what is so increasingly prevalent and common in our society, in our world today. The, the difference between marriage as God designed and simply uh, living together or uh, shacking up is very great. The difference primarily centers in the area of commitment. That marriage involves a commitment. It, it bespeaks permanence. It reflects a, a permanent commitment that two people have made to one another in the presence of God and whatever witnesses are there. They have made a permanent and open, a formal commitment in the eyes of God and man to take one another as husband and wife and to establish a new family unit. The, the problems of living together, the problems of casual sex, the problems of uh, this sort of thing are reflective of an entirely different way of thinking. It is, an inv it is an arrangement of convenience. It's a matter, well, you know, we'll try for a while, it doesn't work out, well, you go your way and I'll go mine. And it is by its very nature, the very opposite. Instead of reflecting and bespeaking permanence, being an establishment that engenders security, a sense of security, a sense of permanence, it does the very opposite. Now, this, of course, is the initial basis of what shapes a young person, because there is a need, there is a desire, one of the first needs uh, is the need for security, the need to be provided for, taken care of. A little child wants to be held close and fed. You know, that's the first thing a little baby wants. He wants to be held close and he wants to be fed. He wants to be made to feel secure. Now, as a child grows and develops, they no longer have to always be held real close in the same way as a tiny infant, but they still do need that sense of security. And there is something that, there is something that, that uh, engenders uh, a sense of security, that feeling of closeness to someone else. God designed the human family as the basis by which the new generation is, is introduced to the world and which they are prepared to face the world. And God designed that environment that it would be one of love, it would be one that would engender a sense of security. Now, the very fact that marriage was intended as a permanent institution is essential and is important to a sense of security. Because if you're living in the midst of something that you think is about to fall apart any day, there's not a whole lot of security that comes from that. In fact, the very opposite, a sense of insecurity. People become insecure, children become insecure. They don't know uh, what's permanent around them. And when you don't when you have a basis of security, then you have a basis to think in, in, in the long term. You have a basis of thinking long term when there is a sense of security and permanence. 
When there is a sense that everything may fall apart tomorrow, people, instead of thinking long term, began to think for the immediate, for the day. Now, we see that reflected in, in our society. We see it reflected in, in one of the great tragedies that has occurred, which is the uh, in the last 20 years or 25 years, perhaps, the incredible rise uh, in the frequency of illegitimate births and of one-parent households. Uh, the numbers ha have increased dramatically in uh, recent years, certainly the last uh, 25 years or so. And the result, of course, uh, has serious implications from a moral and spiritual standpoint, from a social standpoint, even from an economic standpoint. The, the verses we read in Psalms and Proverbs talk about children's children. There is a concept of, of multi-generations. When people prepared something or did something with the idea that eventually their children would have it and their grandchildren would have it, that it would be something that was going to endure. They did things, whether it, it had to do with the farm or whether it had to do with whatever. They, they thought in terms of the future and they laid a foundation for a stable society. They laid a foundation for things that was going to come. They're things that they would never get the benefit of in their lifetime, but their children and their grandchildren would. And it was, it, it has to do with a long-term view. A long-term view produces a society that's stable. A short-term view produces a society that's unstable where everybody's out for himself getting what he can get right here, right now. The world is, is in trouble, and we're, we find ourselves in trouble on the, on the human level because of two aspects of the family. One is it seems that the purpose of the family isn't understood, and two, it seems that the functioning of the family isn't understood. And they're both important. The family was designed as a purpose, as a source of, of providing security, to providing stability, uh, a means of, of uh, providing a secure, loving environment for an entire generation to be shaped and molded and prepared for their place in life. And if we don't understand the purpose of the family, then we're never going to be able to focus in on the way that the family needs to function on a day-to-day, day-in, day-out basis. There's got to be an understanding of that purpose. There's got to be an understanding of a long-term purpose. When God first put Adam and Eve on the earth, or put Adam on the earth, before he put Eve on the earth, what did he say to Adam, or say of Adam? He said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Exactly fitting and compatible for it. In other words, God said, look, it's not a good idea for someone to exist in isolation. There is the need for a balancing. Now, none of us uh, can exist uh, in total isolation in some sort, in, in, in a really uh, properly uh, balanced way. That doesn't mean that, every, that uh, everybody has to be married, but there is a need certainly for interaction with other people. And God designed the family, uh, designed marriage as the basis of the family, that uh, uh, he designed marriage as the basis of the family. And he decided that he designed that permanent commitment that two human beings would make to one another 
to be the basis of establishing a family that is the means by which the next generation will be produced. God didn't design human beings to, to be like dogs and cats and cows. Animals reproduce, they multiply, but they don't establish families. You know, the world talks about evolution, but we're, we're, not, we're not seeing evolution. We're seeing, uh, you know, the reverse. What, what do you call uh, de-evolution? We're seeing human beings descend to the level of animals. We see human beings functioning on the animal plane rather than the God plane. The loss of recognition that that a sense of permanent commitment is at the basis of establishing a marriage. God established that is the basis of establishing a family by which this is the this was to. Uh, it be the crucible, if you will, this family into which the new generation would come. The means by which they would be uh, given uh, shape and cohesion, by which young lives uh, that are impacted by the fiery heat of the world around are going to be given a certain shape and cohesion. So God established the family, and he established, he established that uh, because he said it's not good that the man should be alone. We need the interaction of others, and so the means of that was to start with marriage, uh, to produce children, to produce a family. That there would be a human family, and there would be a basis of of uh, of people. Okay, the aspect of that as a purpose, there is an aspect of, of security, stability. It is a long-term, loving, secure environment. Uh, that security involves uh, the element of love. It involves the element of physical security, uh, economic security, a family working together, preparing to, uh, to build up, to provide, to work together as a unit. You know, all of these factors go in to the purpose of the uh, to the purpose of the family in preparing the next generation, preparing a godly seed. Now, if the family is to fulfill its purpose, it has to function the way it was designed. And the family was was if the family is to impart and prepare the next generation. How is it going to do that? Well, it's going to have to function by example as well as by discipline and instruction. Now, first and foremost, the family that is going to properly fulfill its purpose is going to have to function by example. Because the greatest impact on all of us is what we see around what we see, the, the visual carries greater impact than, than simply what's heard. That's why television is a more effective uh, communicative uh, medium than simply radio. Because with television, you both see and hear. Combine the two. The, uh, but uh, what we see in our lives, what we grow up with, well, the statement has been made that what children see they practice, and what they practice, they become. What we see around us. So a family functions in fulfilling its purpose, or in failing to fulfill its purpose, it functions by example. That is the greatest and the primary impact. The example of how do you deal with life? How do you deal with other people? How do you interact? goes back to what a child begins to learn about that is what they see at home. How does mother and father interact? What kind of respect is shown? What kind of consideration? How do they talk to one another? Do they use loving terms or do they use derogatory terms? Do they shout and scream and throw things? 
Do they discuss matters in a calm way? Do they... How, how do people deal with one another? You know, a little child is introduced on the scene and he begins to, before he's ever conscious, you can't teach a child to say, well, son, don't do as I do, do as I say. You know, it's kind of like sitting there blowing smoke in his face, smoking a cigarette, telling him, now, you know, you need to, you, you, you better not start smoking. Uh, that's uh, not real, that's not a real effective uh, that's that's not a real effective uh, way of uh, of teaching. That we are to function, uh, or the family, if it's going to fulfill its purpose, is going to have to function by example. An example of respect, to a great extent, a young person's ability, or let's say a young woman's ability, to respond to her husband and the attitude that she's going to have toward her husband is greatly shaped by the way that she learned to respond to her father. And a lot of that is shaped by what she sees her mother do. And, of course, the same thing for young men. The, the example that we see of the, the, the way that we interact. You know, Solomon wrote some terrific advice. Best advice any father ever gave a son. In fact, it's recorded in the book of Proverbs. Uh, much of Proverbs is written as the advice of a father to a son. Uh, that's the way it's addressed. Here, O oh my son, Solomon gave terrific advice. You've got to hand him that. He had a real, uh, a real knack for giving advice. It's so good God preserved it in the Bible, which is more uh, than... The advice most of us have ever given, see? Uh, how much of your advice do you think God would want to dedicate a whole book in the Bible to preserve it? Uh, well, I, I don't know. But he, you know, used a, virtually a whole book in the Bible to preserve Solomon's advice. So I would have to conclude Solomon was pretty good when it came to giving advice. But when you read the story of Solomon's life, his example kind of lost something in the translation. He didn't really put his own advice into action in his life. Now, you read the story of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and it doesn't take long to conclude Rehoboam was not a real wise young fellow. He managed to lose most of the kingdom, you know. About 80% of the kingdom he managed to lose first dash out of the box. And just as soon as he got to be king, he lost virtually the whole thing. This would tell me he's not real swift. Uh, when it comes to, to figuring out how to, uh, to, to handle his responsibilities. Rehoboam, as you go through and you read the story, Rehoboam was a lot more impressed and impacted by his father's example than he was by his father's advice. Our example is going to impact our children more than all of the advice that we will ever get. Because as the years pass, they're going to remember what they saw. They're going to remember certain things. They're going to remember that example. So, the family has a purpose to fulfill, and that purpose involves the shaping of the future. The family will either contribute to the stability of society or to the instability. It will contribute to a, fam to a, to a society uh, that is growing a society that reflects proper values or it will contribute to a society that is falling apart. But a lot of that's going to get back to the family. You, we want to instill values in our children. What do we value as parents? If what we value and if what we place greatest value on is material things, then what we're teaching our children by our example is that what counts is what you have. That life consists of material things. Our example as a family, our example as individuals, is one of the most crucial elements of transmitting values to the next generation. What we do, the way we live, the way we handle ourselves. How do we value and appreciate the role that God has designed for us and has designed us to fit into. 
You know, we're told God places every member in the body where it pleases him. One of the, the, the things that has been a hallmark of Western society in, in recent decades has been the instilling of dissatisfaction in people with their role in life. The, establ- the, the, the incitement to dissatisfaction. And so we live uh, in a time that uh, uh, the so-called traditional roles of men and women have been greatly uh, questioned. And one of the problems is that when we fulfill, or to the extent that we fulfill the role that God has designed for us, the more that we fulfill that, the better off we're going to be. The, the, the more closely that we can can fit in with the manufacturer's specifications, the better off, the smoother things are going to go. To what extent do we value and appreciate our role in life? As men and women, as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers. How do we conduct ourselves? Our example is very important. Now, in addition to our example, the family must function by example. It must function also by providing discipline, providing guidelines, by the setting of boundaries. This is one of the purposes of the family, or one of the, the, the way that the family fulfills its purpose. If its purpose is to shape the next generation, then it does so by providing an example. It also does so by providing clear boundaries, providing discipline, providing guidelines, providing a certain structure that is imposed. Because... When a little child comes along, that little child is really not capable of self-discipline. He's not capable of of disciplining himself at all. He can't even discipline his own bodily functions. He he can't discipline his own muscles to where he can stand up and walk. You know, a little child starts out in life really unable to control virtually any aspect of himself. Now, he begins to learn and to develop. He'll, he'll try and reach for certain things. And, it, you know, it takes time. He has to develop a certain amount of, of hand-eye coordination to where he can get what he's aiming at. And they, the whole world is new to them. And they begin to develop uh, the ability to control themselves to control their, their, as their little muscles strengthen and their bones strengthen. Uh, they, they began to learn a sense of balance. And it's always, you know, a little child, a little, our little babies, we, we can all remember back, and those of us who have children, remember and say, uh, when they would, were, would try to take those first steps and would stand there and, and they would kind of teeter-totter uh, back and forth and pretty soon, boom, you know, they, down they'd go. But they didn't have very far to fall and generally the bottom was pretty well padded. Uh, you know, thick diaper, and so it, it wasn't usually too uh, too bad. Uh, but it, it it was a real achievement because it was a matter that we take for granted walking, but it involves uh, a lot of discipline of the body, disciplining of uh, of the muscles and the things to to interact and to work together in a coherent way. All right, a little child starts out unable to discipline or control virtually any facet of his life. And he begins to learn to do that. He begins to develop the ability to to do certain things, uh, primarily by uh, the example of of others around, also uh, by uh, certain, uh, certain things through there. Then he has to learn that there are bounds, there are controls, there, there, is, there are limits within which he has to function. You can't go beyond here. Now, parents, the family unit, is to be a source. If it's going to function as it ought, it's going to have to be a source of discipline, a source of setting and enforcing limits. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12 that God chastens every son whom he loves. 
If you be without chastening, we're told, then you're illegitimate. God doesn't claim you. God is not bringing you up if He doesn't chasten and discipline you because God chastens every son whom He loves. Now, what we're told here, by implication, if God, that if we look to God as the means by which we, you know, how ought we to function, how ought we to conduct ourselves, how ought we to handle the things that arise, that a loving parent is going to be a source of boundaries and guidelines. Discipline for a child. God chastens every son whom he loves. If a parent loves his children or her children, the parents, the parents who love their children provide discipline, provide boundaries, provide proper chastening. It's not an end in itself, but it is a means to an end. And one thing to understand, if boundaries aren't set, if limits aren't set, if control is not established when a child is young, then you may have some unwinnable battles to fight when they're a lot older. If you don't, we're told in the book of Proverbs that he that loves his son chastens him early. He that, he that loves his son chastens him early. Uh, it is a matter that uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, we're told in Proverbs 19, 18, uh, chasten your son while there is hope. You see, there is, there comes a time when uh, there, there comes a time when it becomes virtually impossible to impose uh, to impose guidelines, to impose structure and discipline. If parents and, and different children, you know, some children by nature uh, are are more strong-willed. Some children by nature are more assertive, more aggressive, more strong-willed, and they need a firmer hand. And if they're not given that firm hand when they're young, when they get old, you won't be able to put it to them. Just as simple as that, you've, you've lost it. And it's going to take, you know, the direct act of God to, to step in and, and deal with them at some point in the future. Some children by nature are more compliant, just difference in the temperament of the child. But there is a need for discipline and for structure to be imposed. And the earlier it starts, the better. In the sense that it's, you know, based on what is appropriate for the age level of the child, you don't expect children to conduct themselves or to perform on a level that, that's uh, out of line with, uh, with their age. You don't expect a two-year-old to uh, be 16. You don't expect that uh, mentally, or you don't expect that physically, and, and nor can you expect that in any other way. But the the area of control has to be established early. It has to be established from the beginning. And of course, some children are more strong-willed, and they're going to be quicker to, to challenge that control. And if you don't win those battles. You know, if you put off fighting those battles, then you're setting yourself up for defeat. Because if, if you're dealing with a, with a strong-willed child and you don't resolve the issue of who's in charge when they're young, it will be almost impossible to establish it when they're a lot older. Many analogies and examples that, that serve to illustrate that. Uh, I've mentioned before that the Hebrew word for discipline is a word that, that literally means guidelines. I've used the illustration of, of how you, you can attach guidelines to a young sapling tree to, to change the shape of it, uh, to straighten it up if it's bent. Uh, the older it gets, the bigger it gets, the more hardened it gets, the more difficult it is, uh, the more difficult it is uh, to straighten back up. And uh, you have to do so gradually. The older it gets, and, and uh, you know, it finally gets to a point where you may break it, but you're not going to bend it. And yet, the younger it is, the more easily bent 
is the case. That's why it's important that discipline be a sta- uh, that discipline be utilized from early on, and that the 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 matter of of control, the matter of respect, be established at the very beginning. Because if you establish the if you establish the basis of interaction uh, in the family early on, then you have a means by which you can provide instruction on through the years. You see, discipline is not the end in itself. This is where some have gone wrong and some have, have looked at those who, who, who were very strict on discipline and said, boy, I don't want that result. Because they've seen kids later on who were alienated from their parents or who rebelled when a certain age came along. That is not something that necessarily happens. But if there is a... If, if the discipline is not accompanied by the example and the, the nurturing that is a part of the example and is not accompanied by the instruction to help internalize the principles that are being enforced, then you've got trouble. Because you see, the family functions by example. An example of, of love, an example of nurturing, an example of caring, an example of, of the way to handle life and its problems, the way people interact. The family functions by its example. It functions by establishing boundaries, guidelines, imposing discipline. You know, if, if, if uh, going back to the original analogy of a crucible, if you put ore uh, in, a, in, a, in a hot charcoal fire and you get it hot, the, the metal will melt and it'll run out, but it'll just run all over the place. There'll be no shape, no cohesion to it, because there's nothing in which to collect it and to set boundaries about it. The, the point is that children, the family has as its purpose to prepare the next generation to be uh, usable, to be usable by God, then it's going to have to function not only by example, it's going to have to function by providing discipline, by providing structure, providing guidelines, providing and setting limits. It's also going to have to pro- function by providing instructions. Because the discipline is a means to an end. It is the means to enable values to be transmitted. You see, the problem when you see children getting out from under the discipline and rebelling and kicking off the traces, it's because they never internalized. The va- there was never the, tra- the transition between values externally imposed and values that were internalized. And one of our greatest desires and efforts as parents needs to be trying to help our children to internalize a set of values trying to help them internalize that set of values. Now, if we don't establish control early on, if we don't establish who's in charge, then at a time when their mind is functioning on a level that they're capable of understanding some of these things, they're not going to be listening, they're not going to be tuned in. There is a battle early on for the heart of a child. The battle for the heart of a child, for winning their heart. Not, all, not merely for winning uh, external conformity. You see, some have viewed discipline as, a me, as just an end in itself, and external conformity as being the limits of what that involved. And that's not, that's not appropriate. That's, if, that, if that's what you're after, that may be all you get, but it won't last for long. Now, if you don't even have that, then you don't even have a means of going to the next step. Because if you can't get their attention, and if there's a question as to who's in charge and who makes the rules, then you're never going to be able to to have the opportunity of imparting instruction. But if they don't understand and internalize the proper values, they'll never make the successful transition to adults. There comes a time, there comes a time when they have to make that transition. You don't just go along and allow them to... to, uh, You you don't keep things just the same uh, tightness. 
The extent to which you kind of ease off uh, partly varies with the, the maturing of the child. Children uh, mature in different ways emotionally, just as they mature in different ways physically. You know, some are much more grown up, and there's a wide variation. We can look around uh, that, um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that there's a wide variation in, in ages of physical maturity. There's also a wide variation in terms of mental and emotional maturity, and it doesn't always exactly correlate with, with external physical maturity. Some who may look very grown up may act quite immature. Some who may not, uh, uh, you know, outwardly look quite as grown up, may, maybe they still uh, are uh, uh, less uh, developed and matured physically, uh, yet if you spend a little time with them and you talk with them, you realize that they've, they've matured quite a bit uh, mentally and emotionally. The point is a parent has to know his child. You have to give opportunities that opportunities that are appropriate for the level of the child's maturity. You give them opportunities to develop proper confidence, opportunities uh, in a limited, controlled environment. See how they handle it. And if they handle it well, then you can give them greater opportunities. But it's important that values be transmitted. Because ultimately, there comes a point where the child is, is free, the child is gone, the child is out of the nest, and the only things they're going to take with them is what they've internalized. Well, it's kind of like training wheels on a bicycle. You know, you get a little kid a bicycle and, and uh, you put training wheels on there, not for the purpose that he'll have training wheels forever. You know, when he's 22, he's going to be, uh, you know, pumping down the road with training wheels on it's a big deal to a kid to get training wheels off the bicycle. But the training wheels serve a useful function to begin with. The idea is uh, you, you want him to, to learn uh, to how to keep the bi bicycle up, upright, rather than over on the side, one way or the other. That, uh, I remember the first time I ever rode a bicycle was a neighbor boy's bicycle, and uh, I had watched him and I thought I knew all about it. The only thing nobody had explained to me and that I had neglected to ask was how do you stop it? Uh, somehow that thought had not occurred to me until I got on and I started going. And then I, I, I thought I had everything figured out and knew all the answers uh, until I realized that I didn't know how to stop it. I had never asked how he stopped it, and somehow I had not noticed. Uh, so the only thing I could figure out to do was, you know, hit a tree, uh, which uh, did stop the bicycle. But, uh, you, you know, when you send your kid out in life, you want to try and anticipate some of the things he's going to need to know so that uh, he doesn't find that the only way he knows how to stop is to hit a tree. Now, if you're, uh, you know, a little kid and you're not going very fast, well, chances are it won't do too much damage to you or the bicycle. But you get a little older uh, and, and you're going a little faster, you, you get a little further along in life, and sometimes uh, that can be a, a pretty bad encounter. This is where instruction comes in. God talks about in the book of Deuteronomy uh, that we're to teach our children of these things, the principles of his law, when we rise up, when we sit down, when we walk in the way. Now, he doesn't mean that you just preach to your kid day in and day out all the time, just always with your finger in his face and just, just always preaching at him. Now, that just goes in one ear and out the other. What he's saying is take advantage of every opportunity. When you... Walk, when you get up, when you go to bed. This presupposes, obviously, you're spending time together. You're talking, you're, you're conversing, you're interacting, you're doing things together. Utilize opportunities to convey instructions. One of the most difficult things for the immature mind to do is to make proper cause and effect connections. To make proper connection, proper relationships between cause and effect. Children see effects, they see causes, but they don't necessarily connect the two up. It takes experience in life, it takes experience in life to naturally make connections between causes and effects. A lot of people have bad consequences, consequences they never set out to have. It was not their ambition as a young child, and yet there's 
wound up. There they were. They wound up with those consequences because they didn't see it coming. They didn't recognize the causes at the initial inception. Now, experience is, of course, a means of learning that. The only problem with experience is that you can get some real knots on your head in the process of experience. And so what we want, ideally, is not merely experience. We want guided experience. And we want the experience that is the cumulative benefit. You see, God designed human beings, uh, as I say, the family as a multi-generational unit, which means that we're able to glean from the experience of those who have gone before. We're to learn from those who are older because, you know, if you're a child... The one thing you can say, you know, you've never been your parents' age, but your parents have been your age. They really have, and uh, it wasn't maybe as many centuries ago as you may think. And and the world may be a different place, but it is not as different in some ways uh, as, as, as you might think. That the thing that isn't different is that the feelings, the emotions, the things that the things that are reflective of the way that people are, these are things that uh, continue from generation to generation. Instructions have to be provided. We've got to... uh, we, We have to provide the instructions for the basis of being able to internalize, to make something a part of you. Instruction... In in a variety of ways, instruction first and foremost in in values, in what's important and what's not important, instruction in practical, physical, everyday life sort of things, instruction in a wide variety of things, but it's important in working with and, and seeking to develop communications with the child to spend time together. And and to spend time, look for opportunities and circumstances that are a little out of the ordinary. One of the, I I think one of the best opportunities uh, to promote uh, communication is being out away from an ordinary circumstance. Maybe to to go out on on a family camping trip or a situation where the family is out of its regular routine, off, away from the things that normally occupy our time and attention. When you take us out of our familiar surroundings, the the regular day-in and day-out patterns are broken. There is something about uh, uh, sitting around maybe a campfire that can promote conversation in a way that sitting around a television set doesn't. Uh, Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to spend time together, to pass on and to provide instructions. Because realize that discipline, while it is very important, is only a temporary means to an end. Because ultimately what's needed, of course, is self-discipline. The discipline is externally imposed until the child is capable of imposing it from within. So, when we look at the purpose of the human family, we find that the family is, in some ways, a crucible that is designed to give shape and cohesion to young lives. Young lives that are impacted by the fiery heat of the world around. The family has a purpose of preparing the next generation. Preparing the next generation to be usable and useful to fellow man and to God. But for the family to fulfill its purpose of transmitting godly values and preparing and shaping the next generation in a right and godly way of preparing a godly seed, for the family to fulfill its purpose, it must function through its example, through its imposition of Discipline and structure and guidelines and through its utilization and providing of instructions 
of internalizing a set of values. And as the family fulfill, as the family functions as it ought, it will fulfill the purpose for which it was designed. And all of the things that take place and exist here on the human sphere as God has designed. God designed human beings in his own image and in his own likeness because human beings have a great transcendent purpose. Something that far transcends the animal world. Animals are here. They serve a function in the natural world. They live and they die and they are no more. God designed human beings not only to fulfill a function here and now in the natural world, but God has in store for us the opportunity to function forever as a part of his family. God is building something that is going to stretch on out into eternity. And the things that we're going through and the lessons that we're learning and the role that we play here and now serves a purpose not only for the benefit of right here, right now, but it sets the stage by way of preparation for things that will take us on into the future and on into eternity.